are very grateful to both the Daily Caller and to 710 KNUS. And, and our next speaker had something to do with the Daily Caller's involvement as a presenting sponsor for the summit. He was here last year. Lots of you asked if we would have him back as a condition of you coming back. And so we're delighted once again that Foster Freeze can be part of Western Conservative Summit. If we're going to have a high tech, web friendly theme this, this morning, I would just say that you could find out interesting things about Foster Freeze with a few keystrokes on Google. If you Google the unlikely combination of words, generous capitalist, one of the first faces that would come up is Foster Freeze, the founder of the immensely successful Brandywine Funds. Google again, Wall Streeters for Christ. Wow, is there any such a person? Once again, the proud face of the man and the Stetson and the Buckskins, Foster Freeze. He's crossed me up this morning. He's here in a very, very respectable business suit. And as I warned you earlier, he's got some terrific thoughts for us about what happens to turn American health care toward liberty and personal responsibility and fiscal sustainability after Obamacare. Please welcome our good friend, Foster Fries. Thank you, John. How much time do you want me to take? So cut it short. Try, I'll try. Thank you very much, John. You know, I love being introduced because everybody thinks I'm rich and successful and funny and generous and handsome. And, but really what annoys me is nobody gives me any credit for how humble I am. <laughs> so I had to deal with this. I'm writing a book now called America's 10 Most Dynamic Leaders of Today and How I Trained the Other Nine. Now, now Tucker, Tucker had some very good themes, and one of them was that triggers off what Obama is really saying to all of us. He says, I will not let the 50% of Americans who do not pay any taxes share the unfair burden of the other 50% who are not willing to pay their fair share. <laughs> and that's kind of what he's trying to say. So in talking about health care, I think one of the key points I want to make, the Obama uh, bill in the legislation had nothing to do with health care. It had to do with power. How do we get all these people dependent on government so we will gain power? Talk about immigration. These people are not illegal immigrants. They're not illegal immigrants. They're undocumented Democrats. <laughs> if you look at climate change, cl climate change, the, the, he the German guy who heads up the United Nations uh, climate group said at one of the major conferences, he said, this is not a, con a, a conference on energy. It's a financial and economic conference because it's very difficult to redistribute wealth. Climate change, card check, unions say if we can get card check, make it easier for unions, power. Climate change, power, health care, power. So that's how we have to look at the context of all the things that are happening to us in the government programs now, including Republicans who also love to have power. This is a political class, a political elite it's a little bit like Washington, D.C. has become England, and, and, and we are now out in the colonies. So I'm so excited to see the kind of commitment that is represented in this room. This room comprises the kind of people that are going to make this change and turn our country back, to see so many of you willing to come and to share this. On health care, if we look at some of the absurdities before even Obamacare hit the scene, if food is a lot more important than health care, right? We can't go very long without health care. So why don't we take our health care system and convert it to our food delivery system? Walk in the supermarket, no prices. <laughs> no place. The people who are there to help you have a have a, get a percentage of everything they put in your basket. So they're not going to take you to, to the bean and rice counter. They're going to get you over the, the steak and lobster counter. So you get your big bag full of stores, and then you go to the checkout counter, Someone picks up your bill. How many believe that that would work for the, for the food delivery system? Nobody. But why do we do it for health care? Say that people can't figure out why are my uh, health care insurance premiums so high. What would your car insurance premiums be if the government required you to, 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 uh, to cover 
transmission repairs, tire replacements, and gas refills. Do you think your car insurance would be more expensive? But that's what we do. So what do we need to move to? There are four things that the government on a federal level can do that the states can't do. One, change one line in the IRS code that allows the employer to put money into each of our health savings account equal to what we're now sending to the insurance company. It doesn't change the tax ramifications for the employer, the employee, or the government. But suddenly, we now control that health uh, saving account and we become portable. We're no longer tied to, to our employer. The only reason the, uh, that happened is because at one time there were price controls and the employer said, you know, can we compete for, for employees by giving the retirement benefits and health care benefits? And the IRS said, okay, go for it. Employers don't pay our, our, our car insurance. Employers don't pay our homeowners insurance. So there's no reason why that should be bundled, that our health care is the responsibility of the employer. It should be our responsibility. And by having our own health savings account, we can then buy high deductible policies a health savings account allows us to have an incentive. If, if we have a hurting knee, we're going to say, Doc, uh, MRI's X dollars. L let me ice it for a while. So we have an opportunity to be wise consumers of health care. In the process of doing that, we can reduce the cost of health care dramatically. Obama tried to tell us that the issue with health care was access. Access. Poor Natoma, he said from the TV one time. He says, you know, Natoma couldn't afford her insurance, so she dropped it. And then she comes down with cancer. We can't allow that to happen in America. The next day, Cleveland Clinic says, hey, fellas, we're taking care of Natoma. And we don't plan to file a lien on her house. And by the way, last year we did $99 million of charitable health care. When I went to Haiti about two weeks after the earthquake, there were doctors from all over America who were coming out of a sense of compassion and love for their fellow human beings. And that is the kind of society we have to maintain. If you look at the Good Samaritan story, you all know it. The Samaritans and Jews were not pals. He comes along, sees the injured Samaritan, puts him on a donkey, takes him to the end, here's some money. When I get back, if it has enough to take care of it, I'll take care of it. Jesus taught all of us, we are our brother's keeper. But now we're doing to a paradigm shift where the, the Samaritan sees the injured, or the, the, the injured Jew, Oh, tough luck. Tough. I'm so sorry to hear this. I'll meet you at the inn. Two hours behind me, there's a government worker with a really nice donkey, and he'll take you there. <laughs> That's what we're moving to. We are now in a point, do we want to be governed by rules and regulations? Or do we want to be inspired by virtues and values? A choice that we can make. I love Rick Santorum's speech last night. It's, it's probably illegal for me, for some reason, with the election laws, for me to say, hey, I, I think we all ought to put money, even if he can't make it, well, he needs to be a part of the debate. So how do we get funding to him, even if he has a long shot? So he said, okay, he might not win, but we need that kind of discussion out on those debates as to how do we create a society of virtues and values. Harry, Harry Truman. Harry Truman read the Bible five times before he became president of the United States. And he declared as a Christian nation, us as a, we're a Christian nation. In 1946, he said, in our great country has been demonstrated the fundamental unity between Christianity and democracy. He also said in 1946, throughout the centuries, his, Jesus' teachings, have been validated. If we look at JFK, a Democrat, another Democrat, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, elected four times President of the United States, quote, in a radio address in 1933, we cannot, take into a, we cannot evaluate the progress we've made as a nation without giving due credit to the progress the Bible has played in the formation of our, our public. In fact, when we've been the most prosperous and done the best is when we have most closely adhered to its principles. As you probably guessed, that wasn't word for word, but it was pretty close. <laughs> So if we look at those kind of virtues that were in place in our country just recently, we as, 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 as people who love our country have to get out and main, make sure we maintain this Christian value system. Now in a room like this, there's plenty of people who've gone through the nightmares I've gone through. My wife and I burned out five set of counselors. We were skirted with divorce. My kids and I were estranged. I was bored with business. I was a pretty much headed for disaster. And I know what it means when you ask 
the Lord to be chairman of the board of your life, the transformation that can take place. I know there's many people in this room who have made that same decision, but I want to speak to those of you who have not, and the vested interest you have in maintaining the Christian values that our country has, has embraced for so many centuries. Number one, let's look at the principle, hate sin, but love the sinner. Think of how many five-year-old kids punch your three-year-old sister, a little boy, and the father says, you are a bad kid. You keep that up, you're going to wind up in jail. You are bad. Instead of, Johnny, you're a great kid. I love you so much, but what you did was wrong, and I, I hate this, but I have to discipline you. Think of all the self-esteem that were destroyed by people. When, by the time they got 16, 17 years old, they felt they were no good. They had no potential. Tied into that, Philippians 4.8. Whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is deserving of praise, dwell on these things. God's mandate for all us to be positive thinkers. Galatians 5.2, the fruits of the Spirit are peace, patience, kindness, joy, self-control. Against the year is no law. Think about the concept of self-control. Self-control allows me to decide if I'm going to get angry or if I'm going to be offended. If I say to my wife, Lynn, you made me angry, she's in control. There's nothing that any of you can ever say to me that will offend me because I will decide not to be offended because of Galatians 5.22. Self-control. James 1, verse 2. Be grateful, my brethren, when various adversities enter your life because it will build your endurance, will complete your faith, so you'll be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. Everybody in this room has had good Fridays. We've had adversity. But yet there's the Easter. In our culture, there's always a new beginning, a new exciting start. In Japan, you screw up, you throw yourself on a sword. <laughs> so that, that is so important that we embrace our mistakes as a stepping stone to our next, next success. There's a difference between excellence, excellence and perfectionism. Excellence, I'm sorry, perfectionism hates error, tries to eradicate it and destroy it. Excellence embraces air, builds on it, and transforms it. So we can look at our mistakes, the bad things, the messes we made, and say, what did I learn from that? We don't grow as people when things are going well. We grow when we face adversity through the bad times. All of us in this room have probably had to face four major issues. Fear, not just of snakes and high places, but fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of financial ruin. Two, guilt. Not only things we did, but things we failed to do. If only I'd spent more time with Aunt Tilly before she passed on. If only I'd worked harder in college. If only I'd hang on, hung on that stock that I sold at eight that's now at 400. <laughs> All these what ifs. Three is the issue of love. And when I heard the first, the true definition of love, you know, C.S. Lewis said there's storge, philios, eros, from which we get the word erotic, I love ice cream. That's the kind of love we see on MTV. I love this woman. He loves her the same way he loves a dish of ice cream, to consume her, to enjoy her. But Jesus talked about agape. Love is not an emotion. It's an act of the will to want something for someone or do something for someone that is in that, pers that person's best interest without expecting anything in return. How hard is that to love? We do something, we at least want to thank you back. That's not what love is all about. And the fourth thing that we all have to deal with is significance. What makes us important? Why do we get up in the morning? What's our reason for living, our purpose in life? And if you look at the Christian worldview, it deals with all four of those big time to give us a sense of peace and patience and kindness and joy. But if you look at the government that we now have had to deal with, they don't embrace these values. They're antagonistic to them. And so if you look, at, at the whole idea of the solutions they try to come up with. And to tell you a great story about how these are inappropriate. Man comes home late at night, he's been drinking too much. Falls down, breaks a glass flask in his back pocket. See, I wonder, wonder what happened. He drops his britches, looks in the hallway mirror, he's got cuts all over his butt. So he gets some band-aids, he sneaks in, into the, uh, gets, takes a band-aid, sneaks in bed, doesn't wake his wife up. Next one, you were drunk in a skunk last night. Well, why would you say that? Why do you say it? Well, it was because you left the front door open. And it wasn't because of all that broken glass that's full of steps. And it wasn't because of all those drips of blood on my brand new white carpeting. It was because of the eight band-aids stuck to the hallway mirror.
<laughs> now all of us have to work together as a team. Teamwork, partnership will make us successful. We have enough people in this room that if we each contacted our Christmas card list and got the messages out that Tucker's talking about, of how do you plug in and get the knowledge? It's a great question that was asked. How do we keep abreast? There are websites out there that are trying to alert the American people as to what the real issues are. And the best story I know about teamwork is demonstrated by a young fellow who ran his car in the ditch after a rainy day and he buried his hubcap all the way up in mud. Couldn't get out, forward, backward, couldn't get out, deeper and deeper. So he convinces a farmer to come with a great Percheron horse. You know, those Percherons have a hoof size of a soccer ball. Hook up on the front of the car, pull Jim, nothing happens. Pull Bill, nothing happens. Pull Todd, nothing happens. Pull Homer, pulls him out right out, slick as can be. Kid said, that's pretty impressive, but why do you have to call your horse four names before doing anything? Well, you see, son, Homer's blind. If he thought he's the only one pulling, he wouldn't give a dang. <laughs> <laughs> Tucker also talked about the importance of communicating. We, 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 if we were a corporation as conservatives, it would be like a company with a great research and development part, department, but no marketing. We, we have to be more bold in terms of using assertive words. You know, the left. Bush lied, children died. I think Al Gore actually called Bush a liar, didn't he? But here we have the President of the United States telling, if you don't list this debt limit, you're not going to get your Social Security checks. Everybody in this room knows it's a bald-faced lie. We, we have $172 million coming in a month, billion. We have $333 million billion going out. Our debt service is $25 billion. You pay that, there's no default. The money, when the money comes in, the first you're going to pay is your debt. When your money comes into your household, first thing you might pay is your mortgage or your rent, and you maybe let the cable TV thing slide for a while. We are sending $55 million, $55 million to, to Indonesia to help increase the health of mothers and their, un, and their newborn children. We're, we're sending $2.9 million to China to help prostitutes, to study prostitutes' drinking habits while they're on the job. This, I'm not kidding. This is not kidding. And you can go through websites and find all the citizens of government waste will list a whole bunch of them. The, the amount of money that we're pouring out in useless expenditures by the government is outrageous. So we could prioritize. We're going to pay the meat inspectors. We're going to pay the FAA controllers. We're going to keep the parks open because this is a time when they earn the most amount of money. And we're going to do all these things essential, but we just might be able to give all the people at the Department of Education, Agriculture, and Energy the month of August off without pay. So let's all learn how better to communicate these messages. It's not so much what people say, it's what people hear. And let me give you an example that demonstrates that in spades. Oli, up in North Minnesota, Duluth. He has this unbelievably successful furniture store in Duluth, Minnesota. He is coining money in this furniture store. He says, I'm going to Paris. Sits down at the sidewalk cafe, this gorgeous French woman comes walking up with a mini skirt, sits down. He knows no French, she knows no English, so he draws a picture of a wine glass. She nods, have a little wine. He draws a picture of a dinner plate, knife and fork, and we'll have a little dinner together. They wind up in Oli's hotel room. She draws a picture of a four-poster bed, puts a dollar sign above it. Oli says, gee whiz, how'd she know I sold furniture? <laughs> I cannot tell you how heartening it is to be part of, of this event, to see the speakers, the Americans that love this country, to see you and how much you love this country, and how you realize you have the influence and the power to make things happen. Rosa Parks, 140 pound petite little, maybe less than that, I'm not going to the back of the bus, one person can be tracked the fact that we now have a black person in office, which I am really excited about having the fact that a black person is in office. That shows something about America. How can they, anybody call us a racist society? Sure, there's pennies here and pennies there, but 
I've often wondered, it's, it's, it's not, it's racist if you vote against a black, but if 95% of the blacks vote for Obama, that's not racist. I didn't, I've never really been able to understand that. In fact, there's one guy who, who um, he's getting sued because he had fired this black guy. And the guy is really, he said, I'm suing you because you're firing me just because I'm black. The employer says, look, I hired you because you're black. I'm firing you because you're lazy. <laughs> So let's not be so afraid of being called a racist. I see people have done some of the things that I've done. I to go to Haiti to help. I, went, I go to Malawi, which is a black country, and provide water purification units with Water Missions International. So don't underestimate the power and influence that each of you have. And working together, we're going to be just like Homer. We're going to get this car out of the ditch. God bless you all. Foster, thank you so much. Foster Fries, we love you. One of the great things about the experience at a conference like this, the riches of ideas, of humor, of inspiration, we all have a different takeaway, I think, from each of these tremendous speakers. Personally, my takeaway from Foster is I looked in my wallet, I'm down to my last Band-Aid. I gotta get a few more for safety's sake.